So part two of chapter three is we're going to start talking about perception and how does the infant to two-year-old view the world? How do they take in information? So coming to know the world, perception part two. Perception, how the brain perceives, selects, modifies, and organizes impulses. So they have a lot of stimuli coming in. How do they make sense of it? How does an infant's perception differ from an adult's? A newborn's is much more intense. Can you think of why that is? Well, newborn is learning everything new, right? They have no context of what all of this information is. As adults, we have experiences, we have layers of information in our brain, so we can filter out some of that perception, what we already know, and we don't even notice it, to what's new and exciting. So newborns is much more intense because they're laying that foundation for all these new impulses and making sense of them. So how do infants and even us take in information? We use our senses. So how does the brain interpret these senses and make sense of them? So infants, they have a keen sense of smell. So that's one of the first things that they really smell. And why is that important? so that they stay alive, right? So they recognize the familiar smells, the mother, so they know they cling to their mother, right? All those things for survival. So they react pleasantly to sweet smells, honey, because they need to eat, they need to stay alive. And negatively to bad smells, rotten eggs, something rotten, bad, they need again to stay alive. So they, their body instinctively has a keen sense of smell so that it takes in what they need and rejects what they don't need. Um, they can differentiate among different tastes. They prefer sweet tastes and do not like sour or bitter ones. So newborns have a keen sense of smell. That's when you want to remember. And it helps to recognize familiar people, mother, father, by their smell so that it keeps them safe. Newborns are highly developed sense of taste differentiate salty, sour, bitter, and sweet. They react by smiling, sucking, and licking their lips. Grimace when fed bitter or sour. So that's their first you know, sensory intake and processing is that smell, that they're laying the foundation for later on, uh, making those connections so that they can strive in infancy and grow and stay alive. So all these reactions to sensation is keeping them alive and progressing to that higher function. So they have a sensitive, they have sensitivity to touch. So it elicits, elicits specific behaviors, increased heart rate, cry, etc in response to pain. So we all have pain is to keep us alive and safe because if we didn't feel pain, we would not know to, you know, stop cutting the knife. We wouldn't feel when, you know, if we jammed ourselves with the toe. So same thing with babies. They're learning uh, what's safe so that they don't put their hand in the fire, that, you know, they don't fall off the uh, fireplace. So all that is basic wiring they're learning that right now so they have a very um, sensitivity to touch so that they learn these early on infants best hear sounds in the range of human speech so that makes sense right so the, the, there's different frequencies and you know brains can uh, hear things at different frequencies so infants are hear the best in the human frequency because that's when they're going to learn um, human speech so by four or five months, responds to their name and can differentiate between vowel and a consonant sound. So that's how they're beginning their speech patterns, listening to us and mimicking it. So remember, four or five months, they, they know their name. They can respond to their name. So the things to remember, newborns respond reflexively to touch. So, you know, if you touch them, they, they might, you know, jerk their, their hand or they may come towards you if it's a soft touch. They may jerk away if it's a painful touch. Uh, remember, newborns best hear sounds that have high pitches in the range of human speech, not high or low, but high pitches in the range of human speech. And all senses help recognize the mother and learn about the environment in order to thrive in development. So remember, this stage in the infant is all about survival. So it's all very basic uh, to keep them survival. And the best way to survive is to recognize their mother be able to know when something is going to um, touch them and cause them pain. And if something doesn't taste right, that they get the proper nutrition. It's all about survival.
Now let's take a look at the next sense is seeing. A very big sense, right? Our visual, we depend so much on our vision for balance and to take in the world around us and to interpret things. So what is a newborn seeing? So newborns and young babies, vision is much worse than an adult's. It doesn't fully develop by age one. So let's take a look at what that means. So newborn visual system consists of the eye, the optic nerve, and the brain well-developed post-birth. So a newborn to about one month can see only 20 feet. A uh, normal adult can see 200 and 400 feet. So they can only see really close up. So they can't, you're very blurry far away. So that's why you need to be really close up for a baby so that they can take in your uh your features. So if you're working on simulating that and you're playing with them, you need to be close to them because they can only see about 20 feet, newborn to one month. A one-year-old has about has normal vision compared to an adult. So it, all the vision catches up at a one. At one, they have the normal vision of an adult. Newborns perceive few colors. So this is important to remember. They perceive few colors. Like adults see categories of colors. They see the spectrum as a group of reds. So they'll see whether it's a light red, dark red, medium red, it's all just red. They can't tell the difference. Same thing with yellows and greens. So just remember, they see a few colors. They see just the category, not the details. And about newborn to a month can only see 20 feet in front of you. So stay close with to engage. And a one-year-old has full normal vision compared to adults. So at one, it all catches up. So let's take an in-depth look at visual development. It's supported by rapid maturation of eyes and visual centers in the brain. So that's one area that's really uh, maturing fast, developing those uh, axons to communicate with the, the neurons because your vision is taking in the environment. So the brain knows that it needs to take in around them to stay safe. So how does that, what are the milestones with that improvement? So at two months, they can focus. At four months, they start to their color vision starts to come in. At because remember early on they perceive you know not a lot of color. Six months acuity scanning and tracking so they can start to see details. They'll start to follow you know your finger or, or follow you around the room and track you. And six to seven months they start to develop depth perception so they can tell if something um, is not flat if something has a little bit of um, a depth to it. So if they're going down a hill, they can tell that. Before that, they can't tell. So this is a good example of visual acuity during the first months of life. So the four photographs are going to re represent different stages of the infant. So it would be like you're looking through the eyes of an infant. So the first one on the left, pretty blurry, right? That's what a picture of a face looks like to a one-month-old. So that's why you can understand why they can't uh, tell who who's who, if it's a stranger, if it's a mom, it's pretty blurry. Two-month-old, it starts to get a little clearer. A three-month-old, it's getting a lot clearer. And by one year, look at the color. So just remember how they can't perceive a lot of color? It's just kind of shades of color. But look at uh, one year, it's, it's a visual acuity of an adult. So they can see all the detail, the color is correct, all of that. So this is a very good example if you want to understand visual acuity, the first months of life and see how the what colors kind of look like and then as a year the last one's a year and it's just equal to an adult so now we're going to take a look at depth perception so remember that becomes evident at about six to seven months a child will be able to tell uh, discriminate between depth perception and how they tested it as you look in figure 3.15 here they examine infant's depth perception on the visual cliff. So the visual cliff is the depth perception. So when you hear visual cliff, if that's on a test question, it's depth perception. Eleanor Gibson and Richard Walk in 1960 found that most infants would not crawl out on the grass, I mean on the glass, because according to Gibson and Walk, indicated that they had depth perception. So they can tell that, uh, that it goes down. So they think they're gonna fall off the cliff. Whereas younger, they um, can't tell the difference. They just think that the bottom is equal to the top and they would crawl out. Um, critics have criticized this because they feel like the visual cliff is a better indicator of the infant's social referencing and fear of heights than of the infant's perception of death. But still you want to remember that visual cliff is the glass covered platform that appears to have a shallow side and a deep side and is used to study infant's depth perception. So 
regardless of the critics, is what they've used to kind of indicate when uh, children start to begin to have depth perception. So we're going to look a little bit at perceptual cues. And what is that? So cues allow infants to infer depth. So how do we tell if something has some depth to it? So there's kinetic, which means movement. Kinetic just means movement. And it's visual expansion and motion parallax. So to understand those, we have to understand how people see things. And we see things in three dimensions. We see things in height, width, and depth. So height and width are flat. They're two dimensions. So that's like a picture. We just see the height and the width. And that you just are looking at the surface of the retina. Depth must be inferred from perceptual process and not directly on the retina. So it actually has to be inferred um, through a perceptual process in the brain. So since we look at things in three dimension, kinetic movement is very important because we're seeing things move. So visual expansion is why we flinch. So visual expansion, think of it as um, an object is filling an ever greater proportion of the retina as it moves closer. So that's kinetic. So think about that ball. Someone's throwing a ball at you, and as it gets closer to the eye, you're seeing um, a greater part of the ball, right? So you're seeing something getting bigger as it gets closer to you, and that's why you flinch and get away. That's visual expansion. So as the object becomes closer, it feels more of it gets larger in your visual space, your retina, and you flinch. Motion parallax is when nearby objects moving across our visual field are faster than distant moving objects. So what in the world does that mean? So basically, if you've ever been in a car and you looked outside uh, and the trees seem close to the car because they're moving rapidly, but mountains look like they're moving slow because they're far away. So basically things that are close seem like they're moving fast. So when you're passing those you know, trees on the side of the road, it seems like they're moving fast. And because the mountains are so far away, they seem like they're moving slow. In reality, they're not moving at all. You're moving, right? Um, so motion parallax is that idea that nearby objects moving across our visual field are faster than distant moving objects. Retinal disparity is right and left eye see slightly different versions of the same scene. So this usually happens at seven months, and we use this cue for greater disparity signal signals that the object is close. So that lets us know that, be able to tell a little bit of depth of when the object is getting close to us, so that the right and left eye see slightly different versions of the same scene, and then the brain can interpret it and tell exactly how how far away it is. So it lets us know when things are getting closer. And this happens at seven months. And pictorial cues are an arrangement of objects in the environment. So artists use this to convey depth in a drawing or painting. If you've ever looked at an artist, how they draw, this lets us look like the actual looks like a picture can almost become three dimensional. So linear perspective is when parallel lines come together at a single point in the distance. And texture is um, texture of objects changing from coarse and distinct for nearby objects to finer and less distinct for distant objects. So your book uses the example of the railroad tracks as to show you what linear perspective is. So you can see the railroad tracks are two parallel lines. And the farther away they are, they look like they're more, they're closer together when actually they're the same. But that allows you to know that that's far away and the ones that are still parallel and close um, are closer. So that gives us depth. So a linear perspective means that two parallel lines, that when you're looking at a picture, they look you farther away. That means that they're, um, when the lines look like they're closer together means that that object is farther away. And if they look like they're farther apart, means that the object is closer. So that gives us that depth. So the, the book uses the example of the picture of the sunflowers for texture gradients. So you can see that we know something's close because we can see the actual texture. We can see the, the details have uh, are more detailed, they're finer. Um, closer they are. So they're less distinct. You can't see as many details of the flowers that infers that they're farther away. 
So it's the actual texture, the details in the app, the details in the picture that let us know depth. So more details is closer, less details farther away, and that's texture gradient. Now let's look at this figure. So this is perceiving objects. So figure 3.7 right here shows that after infants have seen the pencil ends moving behind this square, they are surprised to see that two pencils when the square is removed. Because uh, they think that they put the connection that if you have an eraser and you have a lead, that's a whole pencil. They didn't even think of the possibility that there'd be two. So um, this shows that babies use common motion as a way to determine what makes up an object. So you can see they move it side to side. They could tell if you move the, if you're able to move those pencils two different directions, that would let you know there's two pencils underneath there. But if it moves only one direction, that would be one. So that's a way to look at motion, you know, as uh, determining what perception is. So baby and infants interpret patterns of lines, textures, and colors. So they're taking in, this is all that stimuli that's producing those connections, those axons, that's setting that, um, you know, setting all that software in for further development. So by four months, infants use several cues to determine when go to get when things go together to form objects so the important clue is motion right so how could you tell if i give you this picture and i say how can you tell there are two objects you can't unless you move the pencils because you can move the two in opposite directions but a full pencil can only move together in one direction so that's an important clue in being able to know if two are two things go together to form an object Object unity can also include same color, texture, and if their edges are aligned. So that's how babies start to, in how we all developed when, you know, perceiving objects. How we know that an object is solid is one of the, and can move as one is, is, is because of motion. One of the things is motion. That's how, one of the ways we can perceive objects. And the brain takes in all this information, simulates it together, and as we develop, it infers these uh, perceptions where we don't even think about it. That's why an infant's perception is really heightened and ours is kind of muted because we already know all this. Our brain has already processed it. We don't even think about it. We just know it. So we talked a little bit about perceiving faces, but let's look at that a little bit more in depth. Even newborns readily recognize faces. Young infants focus on independent facial features. Those seven months and older recognize the face as a whole. Six to 12 months olds more easily recognize familiar faces in their environment. And it's easier to recognize faces from the same ethnic group as one grows up in because that's what they're exposed to. And so they start to imprint on what those uh, facial features look like. So they're thinking the angles, all that processes in the brain. So that when they see someone else in the same ethnic group, that just registers quick, quickly. So let's take a look at some of those milestones. Newport, newborns prefer normal features over faces in which features are scrambled. So they want to um, look at something that has symmetry, symmetry, something that has normal placement opposed to um, not normal alignment. Upright faces over inverted faces. So something that's you know, if we're looking at you, that the picture is not upside down. If they're looking at a picture, they want to see it in its normal representation. And they prefer attractive faces over unattractive faces. And what determines attractive faces? That's usually the angles and what they've put into a computer and they've shown babies multiple pictures and they look at their responses and they look at the, and they determine um, what an attractive face is by the angles and symmetry. So newborn face recognition may be reflexive based on primitive circuits in the brain. So we're kind of hardwired to um, recognize these things. So why do you think? So that we survive, right? We want to have, we, in order to survive, we need to be with people that have uh, more likely to survive themselves. So people that are, that tend to have normal features, upright faces, attractive, they're going to be more of a, I guess survival of the fittest kind of thing. They're going to be more likely to survive and then, and then in turn the baby's more likely to survive. So it's just kind of a primitive instinct in them. Um, society's a lot different now, but that still stays with us. 
that how do we survive? We're going to go to the things that seem um, healthy. So at two to three months, different circuits in the brain begin to control infants looking at faces. And it allows infants to learn about faces and to distinguish different faces. So remember we talked about that when we talked about facial recognition and how important that is so that they can tell between a stranger and a, um, their mother or their family member. And in the first they recognize human um, before they recognize non-human. And over the first year, they fine tune their prototype of faces. And now they reflect faces similar in their environment. So like I said about the ethnic group, so that every, you know, we all tend to have different features within our own families, but then also with our, in our own ethnicities, the way that um, we all look is different. So whatever the babies are around, they're going to recognize that the, the genes that have been passed through different races and different ethnicities. Um, so at three months old, they, like I said, they prefer the faces of their own race, but they can recognize faces of other races and other species. So at three months, they can tell that that's a dog um, and they can tell that, that if there's different races, they can, they can recognize faces of different races. Um, so what they found through studies, if a child was born in Asia, but was adopted by an a Euro European American, they'll recognize a European American over Asian. It's just whatever they're exposed to. You know, that's what's familiar. They're going to go to what's safe, what's been, they've learned what's safe and what's familiar. Older infants receive intensive experiences with other race faces than they learn to recognize them. So it's just, again, they're exposed to a lot of faces. They're going to recognize a lot of faces. If they're exposed to one culture, obviously that's what they learn. That's all they know. That's what they're going to expose to. So it makes sense. So now let's take a look at how babies integrate all the sensor information that they've been taking in. How do they make sense of it? So babies can detect relations between visual and auditory stimuli. So they can see you clapping your hands and hear the sound of the clap. So they know they can detect that, that when you put your hands together, it makes that sound. So they know that they see it and they hear it. Brains are not very yet specialized. We've learned that, right? This is they're in the process of specializing. So that's what makes this relatively easy for them to do because they're learning. They're learning the connections. So they can easily do it because the brain is so open to make those connections now. They're actually laying down that specialization. That's why when it's, it's harder to learn some of these things as you get older because you've already have that specialization. And infants are very attuned to the intersensory redundancy. So they may pay more attention to movement than the actual sound. So they may be looking more at the hand than the actual sound of the clapping. Or if the mom is moving um, their hand while they're singing, they may be looking more at the movement of the hand than the tune that the mom is singing. So when this integration, grading sensory information, it's considered, when you have all these different sensory information, it's considered a multimedia event. So to this baby, this is their multimedia extravaganza. They're watching the television of the century. <laughs> so they recognize things by sight, something they touched earlier. So if they were touching a stuffed animal, they can, that, they can know that that, just by seeing it, that that was the animal they touched earlier. So they're starting to understand that that um, understanding that the sensation of touch and coordinating it with the vision and putting those two together. So cro cross model uh, perception is the coordinating of information from different senses. So we've kind of talked about that. Um, and that's easier for inference because the brain's not specialized. So just what I talked about, like putting those two together, they can do that because it's not specialized. And just remember that infants uh, see that any information presented in multiple senses must be important, so they pay attention. So if you're going to get the most out of that stimuli of that child, do we do what's called we, we have them touch something while they, you're moving the object. So you're bringing two senses in. It makes the brain more attentive, more ready to take the information in, and you're going to get better results, better results. Uh, learning of the skill. So that's something to remember when you're planning your 
your activities for your children to stimulate their uh, milestones. Think about that multiple senses and how do I pull in multiple senses to get that baby to pay the most attention. So we've talked a lot about the baby, the infant's perception of their environment. When do they begin to perceive themselves, realize that they are a separate entity that is part of the environment? Origins of self-concept do, does not happen until about 15 to 18 months. Um, and a good example is here. You're looking at this mirror. If it was a, a 12 month, they wouldn't, you would ask, where are they? Th- they wouldn't know that that's them in the mirror. They would think it's another person. So about 15 to 18 months, they realize, oh, that's me. That's my reflection. So um, it's an important step in becoming self-aware and that knowing that they are in part of their environment and can affect it. So remember, 15 to 18 months is when they begin to have that origin of self-concept. So let's review what we've learned about self-concept. Self-awareness emerges between 18 and 24 months. And what that means, part of what that means is now they, again, we're talking about them recognizing themselves and they're part of their environment. So they have the use of their own name. They they know their name. They know personal pronouns. So they might say, you know, talk about themselves in the third person or you ask them their name. They're able to tell them, tell them your name. They can say she or he. Then you ask them how old they are. They can say two or they can say they're a girl or a boy. So they realize that they're starting to be a person in the environment that they're living in. And if we go back to that mirror, uh, one of the ways that they tested this is that they would put a red dot on the child's nose and have them look in the mirror. And up until about 18 months, they would touch the um, mirror thinking the red dot was on the mirror and not their nose. So they don't realize that that is them Um, with the red dot they just think that that is part of their environment so that's how they tested that origin of self-concept when you want to look at toddlers you want to look at um, they look at more photos of themselves they refer to themselves by their name again they use pronouns me and i i want you to think back to those developmental theories and piaget's pre-operational thought of children only seeing the world through their perspective right They know their age, gender, self-awareness established by age two. So that's what he observed, right? So this is all in their world. So now the environment becomes reflective of just in there. What is the world according to me? Because I am the center of the world and the world revolves around me. So that's that pre-operational thought of children, only seeing the world through their perspective. Um, pre Preschoolers describe themselves in terms of concrete characteristics. So it's what is, they can't think abstractly, right? So what responses are you likely to get when you ask a three-year-old to describe themselves? They're going to say, I have blue eyes. I like pizza. I can count to 20. I have a fire truck. (laughs) Very concrete. Um, As they age, they become more, more elaborate. The they will study that later in the class but right now it's all about very concrete you know i have a boo-boo you know i am three so things that are very concrete and um about themselves so the last thing we're going to study in this perception and self-awareness a part two of chapter three is called theory of the mind so you really want to understand this uh this concept because it definitely will be something on the test about this but um, what you want to understand is one-year-olds understand intention, intentionality. So basically, they understand that I do something with intention. So theory of the mind is a native understanding of the relations between mind and behavior. And it develops between ages two and five. Um, they understand that people have thoughts, beliefs, and intentions, and they realize these influence behaviors. So they start to about at age about two realize that oh we think about things and because we and we believe certain things to be true so then we act on that because of these beliefs or these intentions then that's going to influence how I act even infants realize behavior is often intentional with a goal right so think about how some of the theories we learned in chapter one they learn by observing so maybe the father says where are my shoes and he looks in the closets and sees his shoes 
and says, there they are. The infant sees this over and over and they see that that action was related to a goal. So they said the goal was to find their shoes. And they saw the action was looking in the closet. So they're observing and they're learning. So even infants start to realize a little bit that there's some intention with a goal, right? If I um, I'm looking for something or trying to find something, then there's intention, there's goal setting. So to understand theory of mind, uh, you got to understand the four stages through preschool years. So number one, they understand that people have different desires. Um, one child might like raisin versus cheese for a snack. So they understand that not everybody eats the same thing. Everybody likes, has different desires, wants. Uh, they know they have different beliefs. So finding a missing toy one child believes in the playroom and other in the kitchen. So they have different ideas like, I believe that toy's in the kitchen. No, but I believe it's in the playroom. Um, so they have different beliefs. They And, and, they, are, and, and they know that. They uh, realize they have different experiences can lead to different states of knowledge. So, for example, a child who sees the toy put in the now closed drawer has an experience that gained knowledge of where that toy is, opposed to another child child who didn't see the person put the toy in the um, closed drawer, so they may not know uh, where the toy is. So they have different states of knowledge. So they realize that I may not know things that another child knows. And then a children, and then the fourth one is that children understand that a behavior is based on a person's beliefs about events and situations, even when those beliefs are wrong. And we're going to look at an example in the next slide. But um, just know that those four stages and they happen through the preschool years and understand that that begins that theory of mind and understanding the intentionality and acting on beliefs and goals. And around age four, children understand that behavior is a result of one's beliefs. And even when those beliefs are wrong. So we're going to look at that next. And language skills or interaction with other people may lead to the theory of mind, right? So how do you form beliefs. You interact with other people, you learn from other people, you observe. Um, that can influence your theory of mind. Um, it helps expand vocabulary, including verbs, describing mental states such as how you think, know and believe, grammar, where a child knows a person has a false belief. So language is a huge influence on theory of, of mind. And so a, a child that has language early is going to have theory of mind and develop these skills earlier than a child that is not exposed to that. So let's take a look at the next slide and understand the last um, stage, um, personal beliefs about events and situations. So I just want to remind you that interactions with different people provide insights into different mental states and they contribute to theory of mind. Conversations with parents or siblings, children, other children, they learn facts of mental life and see other perspectives than their own. So through observation, right, that learning, that learning theorist. They participate in conversations on others' moods, feelings, and intentions that they learn that people's behavior is based on their beliefs, regardless of the accuracy of their beliefs, right? How many times have we acted on something because we really thought it was true when we find out later that's not true? So that idea that people can do that, uh, even though they have a false belief, is what theory of the mind is being able to understand that. So let's take a look at this picture and dive into it. So you can see on the one side that's, that we have Sally and Anne, and Sally has a basket and Anne has a box. And you see Sally puts her ball in the basket and Anne's just watching her. Sally goes out for a walk. Anne takes the ball from the basket and then puts it in the box. Now Sally comes back. She wants to play with the ball. Where will she look for her ball? So what I want you to ask if you are a three-year-old and if you were over four or older an adult, where would you think that Sally would think her ball is? So if you're the three-year-old, um, this is that false belief task because they, they've looked at this diagram and they can see what happens. So they know where the ball is. So they can't understand. They would say that Sally would look in the box because they do not have the concept of theory of mind yet. 
They can't believe that they do not understand how people can act on a belief where the ball is. So even when those beliefs are wrong, because that three-year-old can see and put the ball in the box. So they can't understand that Sally left and didn't see it. They don't understand that because they can see it. They can't imagine. And it's the truth. The ball is in the box. So that's the truth. So they can't understand that Sally left and doesn't know the ball is in the box. So she, she has a false belief. She doesn't know the truth. But a three-year-old does not understand how Sally can't know the truth because they see it. Now, a four-year-old and beyond, if they develop theory of mind, understands that I see that Anne put the, the ball in the box, but Sally left the room. So Sally didn't see that. So she would think it's in the basket, even though we know it's not the truth. We know it's a false belief. So that's what theory of the mind is. Remember, children, until they get this, they're concrete. So what they see is what they believe. They can't understand that abstract, that idea that uh, something that's happening, if you'd say like off camera or not in the line of sight, that they can't understand that. It's either the, the facts are the facts. The ball is in the box. I see the ball is in the box. So I can't, I know the truth. I can't fathom somebody acting um, not on the truth, acting on a false belief. So that's what theory of the mind is. All right, that concludes our perception. And we learned a lot of this chapter three. We learned about zero to two. We learned how much they grow in their, the brain. We learned a lot about the brain and the milestones and all that great stuff. So this week, we're going to have your discussion group. We're going to have a lot of fun with it. I want you to think of ideas, fun play ideas uh, of how to engage children into reaching those milestones. How do we play with them? How do we stimulate the, their environment? And then you're gonna have small little answer section and remember that you have exam one on chapters one and two. So look for me, look at the announcements for more information on that and have a great week and I will talk to you soon.